Pamela Fox. I'm the president of Barry Baldwin College, and it is my great honor to welcome you here this evening for Governor Kane's fourth of ten town hall meetings about transportation. We're always glad to have you back in Stanton, and particularly at Barry Baldwin College. We do pride ourselves here at being a college within this community, and know that as institutions of higher education, we are indeed a place to call democracy to action, and that this is a very appropriate forum to have this conversation this evening. So, Governor, welcome, thank and thank you, you for coming to thank us. You, thank you so much, and I'm very glad you're here uh, to talk about transportation. Let me begin just by acknowledging that I know everybody in this room's got plenty to do, busy, there are other places you could be. Uh, the fact that you've come out tonight to talk about this important topic is great. I love doing these in Stanton. When I was elected governor, I actually came and did a transportation town hall meeting at the Stonewall Jackson Hotel before I was inaugurated. Uh, two and a half years later, still looking for the solution. So uh, <laughs> let me come back to Stanton because I enjoyed that one. I was with a, a number of you about two months ago. I came here and did a town hall meeting just about the aftermath of the legislative session, a little report about what we did, what we didn't do, and what was still up in the air. And I mentioned that transportation was up in the air and that we were going to need to come back to it. Um, but, uh, but that's why I'm here tonight, to talk about uh, the need that we have um, and a proposal that I have put on the table for the legislature to examine for about six weeks before we start a special session on June the 23rd. Um, I want to thank uh, President Fox for her kindness in having us here at Mary Baldwin, uh, a wonderful school, and she's a, been a very uh, solid and, and highly thought of leader for Mary Baldwin. Um, I want to do also one other introduction. I have the Secretary of Transportation of Virginia here, Pierce Homer, and Pierce does a great job, and Pierce was telling me as we were driving here that he grew up in Northern Virginia, but one summer uh, when a governor by the name of Governor Linwood Holton, my father-in-law, started a great program called the Governor's School Programs. It began as summer programs, and Mary Baldwin was one of the first sites for the Governor's School Programs. Pierce actually attended the Governor's School Program here at Mary Baldwin and was glad to be back on campus tonight. Um, it's great to be here with you. Uh, housekeeping, you heard the announcement just at the start, but I'll just put an exclamation point on it. Uh, one in seven Virginians have unclaimed property. And so we have an unclaimed property table set up right up top. Uh, if you have a few minutes at the end of this, you might just want to check because when I was elected governor before inauguration, I went to the treasury office and they said, Governor, do you have unclaimed property? I said, I don't even know what that is. They said, let's run your name and see. And I walked out of there with a $700 check. Um, we have had, uh, and we've, we've had a lot of people walk out of these meetings with checks in the mail, not actual checks. Um, and actually, the state trooper who was driving me the other night found that the state was holding about $1,200 worth of stock shares for him that he didn't even know the state was holding. So if you have a few minutes, you might give that one a try. And then the other thing is there's also a constituent services table up top. You might have a question that either maybe I won't get to or you don't want to ask in front of the group. You would rather just you know give a concern or a question to, the, to somebody and have us track it down for you and feel free to do that with the constituent service. Finally, I'm really glad to have a number of members of local government here. Uh, we've invited local officials um, in every one of these town hall meetings because what I know is this, governors and, and uh, legislators, we sort of pass bills and budgets, but these guys and governors are implementers. They, they implement it in cities and counties, you know. We can pass anything we want in Richmond, but if it doesn't work on the ground in the 134 cities and counties, it doesn't work. And so I'm very happy to have a, a number of great members of local government from the Valley and beyond here tonight. So let's jump in. Transportation, significant issue, and I want to talk first about need and kind of about how we finance transportation now in Virginia and then tell you the plan that I've proposed to the legislature. The, we begin with an aging system. Virginia has the third largest state-maintained road system in the United States. And it's aging, and like everything that is aging, uh, as it ages, more and more need to do maintenance. Um, let me play a little game, and you can't answer this question if you know the answer, but um, we have, how many bridges in Virginia do you think we have to maintain? Uh, 5,000. 5,000, okay, so we must throw out a number. 10,000, 20,000, we have 20,000 bridges. What do you think the average age of a bridge in Virginia is? 40, very close. 
47 years. The average age of a bridge is 47 years. So you have 20,000 bridges, average age 47 years. When a bridge or a tunnel gets to be about 50, then you usually have to start to plan either to do some major renovation or replacement. Um, and so with an, the average age at 47 and 20,000, you know, we got some significant maintenance needs. Um, potholes, conditions of roads, etc. That is where it starts. That's the first thing we have to uh, take care of. Costs have increased. There are some in this room who are, who are familiar with construction costs. You know, on college campuses, some from the, the road or construction <laughs> industry. While America has had a pretty good period of not significant inflation over the last few years generally, that's not been the case with construction materials. So much competition with foreign countries that are doing a lot of construction, cement, uh, iron, steel, asphalt has been going up. Asphalt gets produced using petroleum products. Every time the price of gas goes up, the price of asphalt goes up. And so construction costs have been increasing. Finally, our maintenance needs reduced the available fund for needed improvements or new roads. What happens is we, uh, we don't have enough money in the maintenance fund right now because maintenance costs go up. So what we do is we go into the construction fund for new roads um, and we take money out of that to put into maintenance. And that then shrinks what you can do in urban roads, rural roads, primary roads. Um, next slide. Here's what happens to funding in Virginia if we do nothing, okay? Funding in, in the roads, we can kind of put into two categories, construction funding and maintenance funding. Back in 1988, uh, we were actually doing more construction than maintenance. But over time, you'll see that gray bar just grows and grows and grows. Maintenance costs go up and up and up. And uh, after FY08, the amount of construction starts to go down. It starts to go down because of some reductions in some revenues, but mostly because the maintenance has taken it on. Uh, again, with, a, with a, a growing, old system that needs to be maintained, maintenance dollars start to eat it up. Another little fact, we add about 250 miles a year to the state's road system. Every time a locality approves a subdivision, when the subdivision opens, the state takes over the maintenance. So about 250 miles a, a year is what we're growing by, um, and that increases cost. Other needs. Um, still on maintenance, it's not just about, you know, kind of keeping bridges and everything okay. We all saw that, you know, with horror, that bridge collapse on the interstate in Minnesota this year. You know, we never thought, I never thought, in our country we would see infrastructure like that not maintained and collapsing. But that's a challenge when you don't maintain. We also have a, a more daily challenge, which is if your roads aren't in good repair, it creates safety issues and, and risks for drivers. Last year was the first year in many years where we had over a thousand fatalities on the roads of Virginia. Um, we, we used to have high numbers, but when we put good drunk driving laws in effect, the numbers went down, but last year they crept back up to over a thousand. Um, in the congested part of the states, we see a safety problem caused by congestion, which it's hard to get an ambulance to somebody quickly. The difference in a five minute trip when the 911 calls in and a 10 minute trip is huge if somebody has a heart attack, for example. So even a five or ten minute difference is huge and congestion makes it very difficult to get emergency vehicles to people in reasonable times. So we've got to have additional transportation options to meet these statewide maintenance needs, but also be, to begin to address congestion and provide access. Here's a challenge that we see going forward in the state transportation fund. These local officials know this. We, we run a six-year budget every year. The, the, the Common Transportation Board puts together a six-year plan. And uh, the board recently met, and they had to reduce the six-year plan by $1.1 billion uh, from what they had proposed. Part of it is because we put a bill into place last year that raised a lot of money that we repealed a portion of it, and then a court struck down a big portion of it. So those were dollars that we were going to use for transportation around Virginia that we had to take off the table. Some of this reduction is also because there are revenue sources that are flat or declining uh, as gas prices go up, people drive a little bit less, less gas tax, the revenues start to decline. So federal revenues are declining as well. So in a state that is a growing state, we are a growing state. We're a, we're a good place to live, a good quality of life, people want to come here. We're actually reducing our transportation budget at the same time as the state is growing because of the absence of revenue. Um, let's talk about, you know, a dirty word, taxes. Um, because I'm, I'm painfully aware of a couple of things. First, it's never popular to talk about how you're going to recover. 
Um, and second, this is a tough time. This is a tough time nationally and in Virginia in terms of the economy. But Virginians are smart. They know there's no such thing as a free lunch. And Virginians also know you can't grow your way to economic prosperity with a declining infrastructure. Nobody has ever done it, and nobody ever will do it. Um, in early March, right before I came to Stanton, actually for that town hall meeting in March, Governing Magazine did something they do every three years, which is they rank states in terms of performance. And they rank Virginia, the top performing state government in America, for the second time in a row. They did the survey three years ago. But they pointed out a very serious challenge we have. They downgraded our infrastructure grade from an A to a B from three years ago. And they basically said, and you're going to keep declining unless you do something about it, unless the state decides to invest in infrastructure. Again. So when you're talking about transportation, you're, you're, it doesn't grow on trees. You're talking about how do you pay for it. So let me talk to you a little bit about transportation and how we finance it in Virginia. First, some basic stats. We're fifth in the nation in per capita income in Virginia. That doesn't mean everybody's doing well, and it doesn't mean every region is doing well. But we are, compared to other states, a high, relatively high-income state. We're the 12th biggest state in the country. Our state and local tax burden is 32nd, and taxes as a percentage of income are 39th. So compared to other states, we are relatively high on the income side and relatively low on the tax side. Um, we rank near the bottom when it comes to the amount of taxes spent on <coughs> transportation. Um, let me tell you about the, the taxes that we, that we direct to transportation. Most states finance their transportation system with three taxes. The uh, sales tax on autos, the gas tax, and the general sales tax. So let me tell you where Virginia ranks in all of these. Sales tax on autos. Um, you know, if, if you buy this in a 7-Eleven, uh, you pay a 5% sales tax, 5% sales tax on shoes. We don't have sales tax on food and medicine but the general sales tax is 5%. But if you buy an auto, you pay a 3% sales tax. Um, and you'll see that there's only, the, the US average sales tax on auto is about 4.6%. The blue states are the states with the lowest sales tax on autos. We're one of the eight or nine states with the lowest auto sales tax in the United States. It's always struck me if we're trying to find money for transportation, the sales tax on auto is a pretty direct thing to do. So that's the first revenue source. We're significantly less than the national average. What's the difference? If we had a national average instead of three, if we had it at 4.5, what's that difference? That difference would be about $325 million for transportation that we can spend. Next slide. Uh, the, the, the general sales tax. Again, our sales tax is 5% on items except food and medicine. And you'll see that the US average is over 6%. And the blue states are the states that have very small sales taxes. So we have a lower sales tax than most of the surrounding states. 6.8%, uh, 9.4%, sixes. Maryland just raised their sales tax significantly. Um, and so again, on a sales tax side, we're lower than the national average, lower than surrounding states. Um, and then the final revenue source is the gas tax. Now this is a, a tough one now because gas prices are so high. But take a look. This is the combined federal plus state gas tax. The federal gas tax is even, um, but you'll see the U.S. average gas tax is 45, 46 cents a gallon. In Virginia, we're in one of that group of low states where less than 40 cents a gallon. There's probably 12 or 13 states less than 40 cents a gallon. Uh, so our average is, we're eight, our gas tax is 8 cents less on average than the, than the U.S. average, which is a difference of about $400 million a year uh, less than if we just had a gas tax at the national average. So why do I point this out? Well, basically just to say, if we want to have a better transportation system and there isn't a free lunch, we can't set all of the transportation taxes dramatically less than the national average and say we want a great system. You know, you have a great system if you're willing to pay for it. You have a below average system if you're not willing to pay for it. But you can't have a great system and not be willing to pay for it. You just can't make it match. Um, how does this all combine together? You look at what, what states spend for roads as a percentage of their income. Uh, Virginia spends 1.1% of our income on roads. The national average is 1 .3, nearly 1.3. And again, you'll see we're one of the seven or eight light blue states that spend the, the, the lowest percentages of income on transportation solutions. So therein lies the challenge. Um, we, uh, we have a state that's large, that's growing, that has an aging infrastructure that has significant need, but the revenue sources that support transportation are all significantly below the national average. 
Let's talk for a minute about things other than money, because it's not all about money. I'm going to talk about money in a minute, but there are other things that need to happen if you're going to have a good system. You got to make sure you improve the coordination between transportation planning and land use planning. Now, for many years in Virginia, this has been the way it's been done. The local governments do the land use plans, and the state does the transportation plan. And you can see that there's a flaw in that uh, that basic logic. That was a system that was set up back in the 1910s and 20s. There hasn't necessarily been the greatest coordination between land use decisions that are made by local government, what the state does on the transportation planning side. So over the last couple of years, and I've just put a bunch of examples up there, the legislature in a bipartisan way has embraced a number of strategies to try to improve land use planning and improve the way we, we uh, really put land use and transportation planning in harmony. That's going to help us going forward to make sure that we're not investing in land use patterns that, that exacerbate the problem. We'll try to ex uh, um, invest in land use patterns that, you know, kind of hold it constant or even mitigate the problem. But we got a lot, to, a lot of decisions that have already been made that we can't undo. Uh, next slide. VDOT reforms. Sometimes, you know, folks will say, well, look, why do you need more money? Why shouldn't you just do a better job with VDOT, the road building agency? And, you know, some of those critiques have some real merit. When Mark Warner got elected governor in 2002 and I was elected lieutenant governor, we did a study of VDOT to ask a really simple question. What percentage of VDOT projects were completed on time and on budget? And here was the answer. On time, 20%. On budget, 50%. So there was obviously a huge amount that needed to be done in VDOT to dramatically improve uh, performance. The good news is over the last six years, we have worked very hard to do that. The on-time <coughs> statistic for VDOT now is about 86%, and the on-budget statistic is 91% in the last six years. And VDOT has done that. Look at that bullet at the bottom. We have 2,000 fewer employees in VDOT today than we did six years ago. We've gone from like 10,500 to 8,500 because our thought was, if we can take money out of a salary and put it into asphalt or a bridge repair, that would be better. So you don't want to have too few people, that, and that would undercut your ability. But we've tried to move as much as we could from overhead into actual you know, transportation solutions. And so there have been a whole series of things that we've done in VDOT that have enabled that agency to improve and uh, improve with fewer people. That's part of it, too. Finally. Um, some of the uh, investments we need to make are new kinds of investments. It's not all about taxes and fees. Virginia is one of the leading states in the nation in terms of using toll uh, when we build new roads. Um, and toll, tolls can be controversial, especially if you talk about putting a toll on something that people are used to driving on for free. That can be controversial. But what we have done is in, in a, a lot of new projects that people never had the chance to drive on, when we build them, we build them with tolls. So this is a map of the state with projects that we call Public-Private Transportation Act, usually tolling or some other kind of financing other than tax revenues that we put into building these projects. And you'll see that there are a number of them all around Virginia. There's some little insets, especially in Northern Virginia and Hampton Roads, we're doing it a lot. It's usually easier to do tolling projects on roads that have a high volume uh, because if it has a low volume, the toll has to be so high to cover the cost that nobody want to drive there. But so that's why you see a lot of use of tolling in Northern Virginia and Hampton Roads. The higher the volume, the easier it is to use that. Uh, I was at an event last week with Secretary Barry Peters, the Federal Secretary of Transportation, and she said Virginia is one of the model states in being innovative about using tolling, and we're going to continue to do that. So those are some things um, about the, the size of the need, the, uh, the revenues that we use, the challenges we have, some of the things we're doing other than money. Let me now talk about the plan I have. The plan I put on the table last Tuesday uh, has three basic elements, and they're pretty simple. It's safety first, it is regional relief in the two most congested parts of the state, uh, and it is transportation change. Let's not just keep doing the same old thing and more of it. Let's think about should we do things differently. There's a number of reasons suggesting we should. And so let me, let me tackle each of these and tell you what I propose to do and how I propose to balance it. Safety first. Again, 1,000 people. Uh, killed on the road last year, need to replace bridges and, uh, and infrastructure. And an important one that uh, in Hampton Roads, less important here, but one that I know you'll appreciate, Hampton Roads is this great dynamic economy of 1.6 million people. We know we're going to have uh, 
hurricane of significant force in Hampton Roads, it might be next year, it might be 20 years from now, we know it's going to happen. It is very important to have an infrastructure in Hampton Roads that is capable of evacuating sizable portions of that population within a relatively short period of time. And we don't have that right now. And so these are all kind of safety needs we're trying to wrestle with. What do I propose? Um, what, I, what I propose to do is to end this maintenance deficit. And the maintenance deficit, I told you that we take money out of the construction fund to put into maintenance. Um, in, let's see, 2008, right here, we are at just about $300 million that we have to take out of the construction fund, and it will go to nearly $400 million next year, and you see it grows to almost $600 million by 2014. So if we don't do anything, that's the maintenance deficit we have. So here's my proposal to end that maintenance deficit at least to 2014, and I think, um, and potentially beyond. I would propose to increase the registration fee for a vehicle by 10 bucks. And I would propose to increase the sales tax when you buy an auto or truck from 3% to 4%. So we won't be at the national average in either, but we will increase both of those things. And if we do those things, we will have enough to fill in that maintenance deficit at least through 2014. And you see at 2014, it starts to go negative a little bit again. The projections get harder the farther out you go. But that negative projection is about $40 million, not $600 million. By filling in the maintenance deficit, we will have the dollars we need to maintain our roads and bridges, and we will also be able to leave money over into the construction account and thereby do more construction. And just one example. By not pulling money out of the construction account, let me give you two things. Secondary and urban roads, so roads in cities like Stanton, or secondary roads, which would be rural roads, there would be 135% more dollars in those accounts to do secondary and urban roads. There would be 235% more dollars in the account to deal with the paving of unpaved roads. In rural Virginia, there's a lot of school buses that still travel and pick up kids on unpaved roads, which is a safety issue. Not all of those roads have to be paved, but some of them should be paved. We'll end up with more money to do that if we can fill the maintenance deficit. So that's the first piece of the plan. Let's be about safety first before anything else. Those two adjustments, $10 registration, and uh, raise the sales tax on a vehicle by 1% will fill in that deficit. That's piece one. The second piece is, is less um, relevant maybe to, uh, to stand in this area, but it is worth just mentioning for a minute because the second piece is what I call regional improvements. Last year, the legislature passed a big package of taxes and fees in Northern Virginia and Hampton Roads to raise money for those regions for congestion relief. And this was a Republican bill. Both houses were Republican. They passed the bill. They sent it to me. We worked on it together. Unfortunately, because the, the legislature did not want to do the statewide imposition of taxes, there were some creative thoughts to this. We all worked on it together. Supreme Court struck it down and said, you can't do it that way. The idea last year was set up regional authorities and have regional authorities impose these taxes. About 200 million a year in Hampton Roads, 300 million a year in Northern Virginia. Supreme Court said, if you want to impose it, you got to do it yourself, legislature. <clears throat> so what I have done in the second piece of the plan is I've come back and said, okay, the legislature wanted to do this for these regions last year. So as a state, let's impose taxes in these two regions, raise the money in the region, and the money stays in the region. And, the, and my proposal is simple. A 1% sales tax in Northern Virginia and Hampton Roads added to the 5%. Not on food, not on medicine. If you add 1%, you raise almost exactly what they raised last year that was struck down, 300 million, 200 million. And you get congestion relief in Northern Virginia and Hampton Roads, Metro, Virginia Railway Express, key bridges and projects in Hampton Roads to cross the water. So that would not affect anybody here in Stanton in terms of in your pocketbook, but it, in some ways it would have an effect, and I just want to point this out. The Northern Virginia and Hampton Roads economy are the two most vibrant economies in the state, and they do produce value for the rest of the state. Um, a lot of taxes paid by folks in Northern Virginia get spent in the education budget that supports schools in the Shenandoah Valley, the South Side, and Southwest. A lot of taxes paid in Hampton Roads get spent in social service programs or jail and prison operations all over Virginia. Those are the two regions that actually export some money to the rest of the state. It is important to all of us to try to keep their economy small. And so as they have congestion that you know, that, that limits the ability of the port, for example, to be all it can be. Well, that hurts Virginia. It hurts the inland port up in Winchester, which has been a good thing for the economy of this region. 
So even though this uh, is not a tax that would be imposed in this area, it would just be in those regions, helping those two regions be successful does have a value to the Shenandoah Valley and everywhere in the state. Um, so that's, that's all I'll say about the second piece of the plan, regional improvements. Third piece of the plan is this, third and final piece of the plan. I call it transportation change fund. And the idea is, you know, rather than just do what we've been doing and try to do more of it, or do what we've been doing and catch up with our declining purchasing power, let's think about the fact of should we do some things differently. Um, because obviously, if you're planning for transportation with the assumption that gasoline's going to be a buck fifty a gallon, that would be a whole different plan than it's going to be four dollars a gallon and then it's going to be going up. We need to think about transportation differently. Some of the land use items I put up on the table that we've already done, that's, that's a different way of thinking about transportation needs. But another thing that I think is different is more of a focus on rail and public transit. As gas goes up, more and more people want to use rail and public transit in all parts of the state. The, the big metropolitan areas certainly, but in all parts of the state. We see increased demand for transit everywhere in Virginia by people who can't afford to drive, by the elderly, by folks with disabilities. Uh, there's all kinds of folks who want to use public transit, and that demand is going up and it's going to keep going up. So what I have proposed to do is come up with a fund that would um, be about $140 million a year. We would put 75% of it into public transit and rail. We put the other 25% of it into economic development. Um, in Martinsville, for example, the problem isn't congestion. The problem is we would like some activity. We would like some congestion. We can't get it because we don't have a road network that will attract jobs here. And so the 25% in the change fund is not transit or rail is to do economic development investments so that if I could bring a, an employer into some of these regions of the state um, by, by building better rail access or by building a better road network in those parts of the state, we would use it for designated economic development projects. How do I raise the $140 million for this transportation change fund? What I would do is I would propose an adjustment to a tax that's been very that's been flat in Virginia for a long time called the Granger's Tax. If you sell a piece of property in Virginia, for every $100 of the sales price, you put a dime into the state general fund as a tax. I would propose increasing that by a quarter so that uh, for every 100 bucks, instead of 10 cents, you put 35 cents in as a grantor's tax. And that money would all go toward this transportation change fund. 75% would be spent rail public transit, 25% on economic development. Um, and, the transfer, and, and the rail and public transit is not just not just uh, vehicles, some of it would promote telework. 70% of the state's employees in the Department of Taxation now work at least one day a week from their home. Particularly in the congested part of the states, if we can keep employees off the road one day a week, we help deal with congestion problems. We're building broadband access throughout Virginia State. Whether it's telework or carpooling or ride sharing, we can spend some of this transportation change fund money on that. So next slide. If we do that transportation change fund, here's what happens to rail and public transit investments in Virginia. You see we're not much of an investor right now. Last year, the legislature did pass a bill. A piece of it that survived last year was some increased investments in public transit. So we actually increased. But these blue uh, columns show the additional investments in public transit and rail that we could make with this transportation change fund. So that's the plan. Um, and. Uh, you know, I've been candid about it. Uh, there's no way to raise it without raising some revenues. Some of you are probably thinking, gee, Governor, why didn't you raise the gas tax? Um, and, uh, and, and I've been asked that question at all, my public, at all my town hall meetings, and so let me just mention that for a second. The gas tax is, is the revenue source that we lean most on now. That uh, the state portion of is 17 and a half cents a gallon. Um, I, I did not propose, an, and it's a great user fee, and it's just used by users of the roads. I did not propose an increase in the gas tax for two reasons. First, with gas prices being what they are right now, I just thought that that would hit hard hit people probably the hardest. If you, do, if you live in an area where there's public transit, you have an option. But a lot of people live in parts of the state where there's no public transit. And gas is like food and medicine. It's a necessity of life to get to work, to get to school, to get to the hospital. And so I did not choose to increase the gas tax in my proposal. There's some good reasons to, in, to try to fund it off the gas tax. We were chatting earlier. Uh, you know, a good chunk of the gas tax, 20 or 25%, is paid by out-of-staters. That would be a good thing. 
But with gas tax prices being where they are, I chose not to increase them. The second reason I did increase them is this. In my dialogue with the leadership of the House of Delegates, they have always said the gas tax is the one thing that they will not increase. Now, they've not said that they agree to any of this. In fact, they said they don't like it. Um, but, you know, that's fine. They, but I just say, come up with a better plan if you don't like it. But, but they have always said, Governor, we're not going to increase the gas tax under any circumstances. So if I rolled out a plan that, hey, we're going to do this with the gas tax, they would basically say, well, you're not serious. You're not really in a serious dialogue with us. You don't want to solve this problem. You just want to make a point. I want to solve the problem. So I'm trying to propose a way to do it that does not rely upon the tax that the House has told me is the, is the least popular of the taxes. Um, here's what happens. Um, I showed you this chart at the beginning about construction and maintenance and how the maintenance keeps going up and then the construction drops. If we pass the plan I put on the table, uh, the blue line is now what happens on the construction budget. So you don't see it falling down statewide to just a couple of hundred million dollars. It's still, it stays over a billion dollars a year into 2019 uh, for construction in this very large and growing state. So that would be what would happen if I put my plan in place. Next slide. Um, let me show you something else that would happen. And I'm going to show you two slides and go back and forth a little bit. Uh, and this, these will be the last slides, and then I'll, I'm going to conclude and open it up for questions. Um, we have the six-year plan, and I mentioned to you that we had to change the six-year plan to take projects off the list because the revenues are going down. So this is the Stanton District of Virginia for transportation purposes, and it goes all the way from Covington down to Allegheny, all the way up through Winchester to the West Virginia border uh, and the border of Maryland. Um, these are the projects, the projects with dots on them were the projects that were on the six-year plan before April. And they were all projects that we were going to do at one time or another during the six-year plan. But you'll see that we have some of the projects are in red and some are in yellow. When we had to scale back the six-year plan, we had to take some projects off the list completely. So the, the projects in red were projects that had to be scrapped off the six-year plan. The projects in yellow were the projects that had to be significantly delayed because of these reductions in revenue with the maintenance deficit and everything else. That is the effect of the maintenance deficit and the declining revenues on the six-year plan for projects in this area. If we do my plan, the map looks like this. You see, there's a lot of the reds have turned to green. And if I can ask, let's see, if you can just switch back and forth, okay? So that is before, and then that's after. And do it once more. Before, look at it for a second, don't change yet. Maybe focus up in the Winchester, there's a lot of red up there, now switch. Okay, you see a lot change to green. Look down in the, you know, Stanton down in this area. Go back to the, you'll see a lot of red around Stanton and South. Now switch. A lot of the reds and yellows change to green. What are some of these projects? Let me just tell you what some of them are. Um, Port Republic Road is a big project up in the Harrisonburg area. That one is a red. We can make that a green if we do my plan. There's a, there's a, a park and ride, a series of park and ride facilities in Winchester. Uh, Winchester area is one of the fastest growing parts of the state. Put park and ride facilities in to accommodate public transit. Those park and rides come off the list uh, if we can't do this. Um, there's a, a, an important bridge in Allegheny County called Crown Run on Route 159 uh, that we can't do, but if we do my plan, we could. There's a bridge over Whiskey Creek in Augusta County. Somebody's got to know where that is. I, I don't know where it is, but there's a bridge that needs a replacement. You guys know it needs a replacement. With, a pl with this plan, we can do the replacement, but we can't without. Um, Front Royal to I-66, there's a need for some significant improvements on Route 55. Those won't get done without this plan. They would with this plan. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, with my plan, we'll be able to increase the funds for paving unpaved roads by more than double. And we'll be able to do more spot safety improvements on I-81. We decided to abandon because there wasn't the right money, and there, frankly, there wasn't the public support for it, the massive quarter-length quarter widening of I-81. That was not what the community wanted. But there is a need for safety improvements. There are stretches along I-81 where there are more accidents where we can go in and do safety improvements there. If we do this plan, we're going to be able to go in and do those without a six-year plan on container. And so that's basically the pitch. Um, it's a time for action. Uh, it is a tough time, admittedly. But again, I'm struck by the notion of this isn't going to go away. It's just going to get more expensive. So if we don't address it now, well, we could address it five years from now. Construction costs will have been going up. We we'll have to be looking for more. Um, this is a problem. Lincoln had a great phrase. You can't uh, avoid tomorrow's problems by evading them today. 
Um, and this is a problem of today. In fact, it was a problem of a number of years ago that we've been avoiding. Um, but I put a plan on the table that I think is a good, solid plan to do the job. And I'm just encouraging legislators, hey, if you can prove it, God bless you. I want you to prove it. But don't do it. Don't, uh, don't go, come for a special session and leave it at the end. With that, um, I'll finish and I'll open it up for questions. And I'm glad to uh, 